Hello everyone, my name is Cole, and welcome to the 8th and final episode of How to Design Levels for Video Games. In the last episode, we discussed the procedure involved with playtesting and iterating on our level designs, and I also showed off how I made improvements to my Super Dungeon Maker level, using the 12 principles of level design we discussed previously as a guideline. Now there's only one of the four steps of the level design process left to talk about, which is exactly what we'll be doing in this episode. Today we're going to look at how we can polish up our levels so they'll look nice and finished and ready for release. Now there's two things I want to mention before we begin. One, this episode might come off as a bit different from everything else we've talked about up until now. This is because for this stage of the process, it begins to involve a lot of stuff from other aspects of game design, including lighting and art. Since this series is meant to be focused strictly on level design concepts, I'm going to try and avoid making this episode a full-on tutorial for these subjects. But because of how important they are for level design, I thought it would be a good idea to talk about them. And second, this is going to play out pretty differently depending on whether you're working on a team or on a solo project. I'll talk about the differences in what you'll need to do in either scenario. So with all that out of the way, we can move forward. One final time, let's get started. The first thing that you'll want to do is set up some proper lighting on your level. Lighting will help to establish a mood and increase the player's immersion while playing it. Without it, the level will feel incomplete, stale, and frankly uninteresting to look at. Above all, you should aim to think about the function of the lighting in your level as a way to enhance the player's experience. In particular, it can be a useful method of signposting to help guide your players towards important parts of your level. For example, if a player sees a brightly lit spot in an otherwise dim level, they'll naturally be drawn towards it. If you're working by yourself, then it's a given that you'll have to handle all of the lighting on your own. But if you're working on a team, it's possible that there will be someone whose job is to handle all the lighting in the game. In some cases though, especially on smaller teams, you might be tasked with doing it yourself. Regardless, let's go over how you can light up your scene. To start, there are a few types of basic light sources available to use in most game engines. For example, in Unity, you have access to the following. Directional lights, which are light sources that cast light constantly in one direction across your entire scene. Point lights, which cast light equally in all directions from a specific point. Spotlights, which are cone-shaped lights that are cast from a source onto one specific spot of your level and area lights, which cast light everywhere within its perimeter. There's two distinct modes of lighting you can use. There's static lighting, which saves or bakes the lighting data into a light map. This means that the lights can't change at all during runtime, including position, intensity, and color, but it greatly reduces the rendering cost, making the game run a lot smoother. And then there's dynamic lighting, which can change and move in real time, but is significantly harder to optimize. You should also know about skyboxes, which serve as the backdrop for a level. They project an image way off in the distance, featuring things such as the sky, mountains, and buildings, to make the level feel significantly larger in scale than it actually is. And they also do a lot to improve the general atmosphere. Use one that will work well within the visual theming of your level. When you're setting up the lighting, you need to make sure that it looks realistic and natural. Establish discernible light sources so the player knows where the light is actually coming from. For example, a point light could be coming from a light bulb, while a spotlight could be coming from an open door or window. You should set up the lighting in your level in three steps. Step 1. Key Lighting this is where you'll set up the general ambience of your level, and it's mostly to establish an atmosphere more than anything. This includes stuff like skyboxes and ambient lighting. Step 2, signpost lighting. These are lights that are used to guide players along the level's critical path. Examples include lights that come from doors or from the end of a dark tunnel. Step 3, high lighting. These lights are used to emphasize different gameplay components of the level to make them stand out to the player. For example, they could be used to highlight a group of enemies from a distance, or show off areas that can be explored to the player. Once this is done, you can start tweaking the lighting so that it looks just right. 
You should play test the level as you go along and make sure it's exactly how you want it. Once that's finished, you should be good to go. Next, we'll move on to adding the environmental art to our level. You'll now need to replace the basic geometry that you use for your block out prototype with polished art assets. Basically, it's time to begin dressing up your level. If you're working as part of a team, there will be an artist or artists on your team who will handle the creation of all the art assets. Then they'll either jump in and replace everything with their assets by themselves, or give them to you to do it. However, if you're working by yourself, it'll be up to you to handle everything. I'll go over some advice on how to deal with this shortly. As I mentioned back in episode 4, when you're doing the initial concept for your level, the artist on your team will approach you with some restrictions regarding the visual and aesthetic requirements. They'll usually show you some concept art so you have a reference for what they want to do. From the beginning of the design process, you must take into account how your level design will fit with the artist's vision. There are two categories of art assets. Sprites, which are used for 2D games, and models, which are used for 3D games. When you're finished with the block out of your level, you should take a screenshot of it, and then make notations that outline what everything in the level will be replaced with. This will then be transformed into an asset list, which details all of the required art assets for the level. Then, whoever is creating the assets will get to work on designing and texturing each model or sprite. On the other hand, if you're working on your own project, you have a couple options. You could choose to create the art assets yourself. This is a lot of extra work and requires tons of knowledge outside of level design, so I wouldn't recommend it, but it's an option if you really want to. You could outsource the work to somebody else to model everything for you. Of course, this is going to cost you, and it won't be cheap, especially if your level requires a lot of assets. Or you could use pre-existing assets. For example, the Unity Asset Store will provide you with asset packs to use. Many of them will cost you money, but it's a fairly affordable option. For a solo level designer, this is by far your best bet. It allows you to prioritize designing your levels rather than creating art for them. Regardless of the option you take, once you have all of your required assets, then it's time to jump into the scene and start replacing everything. While you're doing this, you should mainly be concerned with the organization of everything. You need to make it readable. That is, you need to make it easy for the player to understand the environment around them. Everything needs to be set up so the player knows where they can explore, and where it's off limits. And it's also important to avoid cluttering everything in a way that obscures the level. Remember, even if your level is easy to understand in blockout form, it's not guaranteed to look as good when you add in the assets, so be prepared to make adjustments if needed. Here's a few tips. Start with the most important core details of your level, and then work backwards from there. Save the smallest, most intricate details for last. Work categorically instead of just replacing assets randomly. For example, if you're adding foliage and trees to your scene, do that all at once. Or you can choose to focus on specific parts of your level one at a time. Make multiple iterations of art passes. Playtest your level and determine whether or not any of the assets need further improvement as you go along. Keep at it, and eventually you'll end up with a very nice looking level. By now, the level's as good as done. You're now fully prepared to get it ready for the game's release. You should begin by making sure that you've properly documented everything for your level design document. If you're a solo level designer looking for employment, then you should also use this as a portfolio piece. Either way, here's what you should do. Take several high-resolution screenshots of your level that show it off in detail, and from different angles. Document your work process with screenshots of the different stages of design along the way. Organize all of the diagrams and maps that you made for the level. Write a description of the level. Ideally, you should keep it concise. You don't want to bore people with all the details. Record a gameplay demonstration to post online. Make sure that the video emphasizes the primary concepts of the level. Once you've finished all of that, you simply have to release the level to the public. 
There are a number of ways that this is done, depending on the project you're working on. It might be included in the release build of the game, or it might be added in the form of a free update or DLC. Other possibilities might include releasing it as a community map for a pre-existing game, or in the case of my level, it'll be released for people to play in Super Dungeon Maker. Once the level has been released for the public to play, there's always the possibility that it will be iterated on in the future. The nature of game development in the current generation allows developers to release projects and then continue to work on them, in the form of updates. If it comes down to it, be prepared to work further on your level post-release. Most of the time, these iterations are usually relegated to simple bug fixes, balancing patches, or polishing, and usually don't make any changes to the actual layout of the level. But that's all in the future, so for now, none of that matters. You can now safely say that your level is finished. So what comes after that, you ask? Well, you got one level done, but that's just the beginning. Your game is going to need more than just one level, that's for sure, so now it's time to get to work on the rest of them. The good news is that the experience you gain from designing the first level for a project is going to shape the experience of designing every other level, and make the process a lot smoother. It's always tricky to find your footing. The first couple levels you create are going to be a big challenge to figure out. But after that, you'll have a much better understanding of the approach you want to take for the level design in that project. Soon you'll be whipping up concepts and designing levels at a much faster pace. Despite this, it's still important to take your time. I always recommend working on one level at a time. Otherwise, you'll be trying to split your attention between multiple levels at once, instead of focusing on perfecting a single one. But once you've got this momentum going, you're only going to get better and better at designing levels. So keep going and keep designing. And so, that brings us to the end of the series. First off, I want to say that above all else, I hope that this series has been useful to you in some way. This has been my first time trying something like this, and I'm sorry if I've at all neglected to talk about anything important. I want it to be something that would make it easy for people to quickly learn the basics of level design. I tried to make the series as comprehensive as possible, while also covering as many topics and concepts as I could. I've actually learned a lot about level design myself working on this project, which has made it especially enjoyable to work on. And of course, I had a blast designing my Super Dungeon Maker level, which at some point I plan to release publicly for people to play. So here we are, and I hope you're all eager to get on with creating levels for whatever projects you might be working on. For the last time, this has been Cole Miller, and thank you all so much for your time.